what does this DC-10, this DC-8, and this DC-6 all have in common? Let's find out on a special edition of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Mashad. By popular request, what these three airplanes have in common, and I'll throw in a fourth just for good measure, is that they're all flown by Canadian Pacific Airlines. How do we know? Because we're looking at the color schemes. And we're going to continue our history of airline color schemes with part two. In part one, and I'll have a link at the end of this and in the title block as well, uh, we talked about the evolution of color schemes from the 1930s with the Martin uh, Clipper that you see up at top to the jet age and the jumbo jets in the 1970s with the uh, 747 you see at bottom. And both these airplanes are in the same scale. We talked about how uh, color schemes and logos uh, are adapted from their original era to uh, the jet age and how uh, different color schemes on the same airplane can make the airplane look very different. And look at the tail number. It's the exact same airplane. We had a special uh, focus on the change from the piston-powered airliners to the first jets, how those color schemes were adapted. And in this episode, we're going to talk about that same transition from the narrow-body jets to the wide-body jumbos. We're going to be looking at air, uh, airlines uh, all from all over the world, but let's start with a few U.S. airlines, and here we have the proud bird with the golden tail, Continental. The Continental color scheme on the first 707 was quite striking in its own right, but in the 1980s, Saul Bass designed the famed Globe logo that you see there on the 727-200. And here we see it on the DC-10. You notice that the fuselage is painted all white on this airplane. And uh, believe it or not, in the Douglas Paint Shop at Long Beach, there were 39 different shades of white. And what I mean by that is there were subtle tints in the white to adapt it to whatever colors were on the rest of the fuselage. But here we see the distinctive uh, continental, uh, what's called a meatball. That's the round logo on the tail of the airplane. And you notice that it's in black on a gold background. At, oh, no, it's red on a gold background. It's red with white stripes. On a, well, this is what I call Machat's Law of the Inconsistencies of Airline Markings. But regardless, it still looks pretty sharp. Now, here's your bar bet question for the week. True or false, in 1947, there was an airliner that had two decks, a spiral staircase, down to a lower deck lounge. The epitome of luxury in the air. The answer is true. It was this airplane, the Boeing 377 Stratocruiser. And we see it here in Northwest Airlines markings with the distinctive red tail. Let's talk about that for a minute. That color scheme evolved into the jet age. You have the delivery scheme on the 727 at the bottom and then see it adapted to the jumbo jet scheme on the uh, 727 at top. But take a look at this and uh, can you tell what airplane this is? I'll give you a second. Well, it's a little bit of a trick question because this airplane never existed. It was originally called the MD-100, and it was the first attempt at uh, uh, making a stretch a DC-10 in 1981. Uh, the airplane was, uh, the design concept was canceled in 1983, and then it was resurrected in 1989 to become, guess what, the MD-11. But what we're looking at here is an airbrush rendering on an existing DC-10 photo that was stretched and changed to make it look like this. And no, Northwest uh, Orient never flew the MD-11, but it sure did fly the A320. And uh, let's talk about some of the nicknames that were given to unique and distinctive color schemes. In this case, this was called the bowling shoe. This design uh, on the Western DC-10 was called the swizzle stick. This design on the 737 was called Bud Light because it said looked like a beer can. And uh, on this uh, Air France 747, look at the tail. And this is called the barcode. And uh, thanks and a special shout out to my good friends, Ruben and Robbie, for uh, giving me that one. Now, have you ever heard of a Delta Golden Arrow? Well, uh, believe it or not, that was the original name for the Convert 880. And you see here taking off uh, out of San Diego um, with a beautiful, distinctive 
gold, the metallic gold color scheme, which in my opinion is one of uh, the best uh, ship one prototype factory color schemes ever flown. But as mentioned in part one, the 880 was delivered to Delta in a striking all white scheme. It was called the aristocrat of the jets. But before too long, that was modified into this, which was a much more realistic uh, bare metal wings, engine pylon, lower fuselage, horizontal stabilizers, required a lot less maintenance and cleaning. And then we have, of course, the uh, famed uh, Delta widget seen here on a 727-200. Then we had this Delta scheme and this Delta scheme and this Delta scheme, the current colors. Let's talk about wing markings. Back in the prop era, this was all the rage. We've had the uh, big name of the airline on the lower and upper wings. And special kudos to uh, BEA, uh, British European Airways, for their red wings, upper and lower surfaces. Pretty, pretty striking. Uh, United had this ginormous United title on the uh, upper and lower wings. Couldn't miss it. And here we see it... Uh, translated into the jet age with a black letter uh, United title on the wing of the caravel there. Pan American shortened the name to Pan Am on the upper wings of their 707s. And TWA had these very uh, large and distinctive markings on its wings. Now, look, this isn't to be, uh, you know, to make the airplane more identifiable for people looking down on it from higher altitude. Uh, what this was really was brand identity for the passengers uh, in the airplane looking out at the wing and seeing the name of the airline proudly displayed. Now, you know what this looks like today? It's still being done, but it looks like this. And this is a, an engine display in the terminal uh, for JetBlue at JFK. Let's look at some international airlines from around the world. Here we have a beautiful color scheme on a, a Tupelo TU-114. Uh, and you notice the dual markings there. You have Japan Airlines and Aeroflot had a uh, interlink uh, service from Moscow to Tokyo. Here's earlier Aeroflot markings on the first twin jet to go into service, the Tupolev TU-104. Now, would you like to see a TU-104 in flight? How about that? And into the 60s with this uh, striking scheme on the IL-62 landing at JFK. That's my photo. And on into the modern era, you have the Aeroflot version of the billboard scheme at the upper left and uh, 80s, 90s, and current schemes uh, for the airplanes today. Now, here's my personal vote for the coolest evolution of a color scheme ever. British European Airways, DC-3 or Dakota, as they called them in England. And look at this on the uh, Vickers Vanguard. And look at this on a de Havilland Trident. That's quite an evolution. Uh, let's go on to uh, South America. We're going to look at Varig, and you see this uh, uh, very distinctive scheme on the uh, Lockheed Electra. And look at how that works on the DC-10. And I want to make a special mention of how the word Varig integrates with the L2 and L3 door that you see there. Uh, notice the V of Varig points right at the door. That's a pretty neat touch. And then look at this on the MD-11, uh, an amazing use of color. Normally, when you break the fuselage up with uh, an area of color and an area of white, it, uh, it can be pretty jarring, but this is very effective, very nicely done. And uh, let's uh, fly on down to Australia. Uh, Qantas was the first international carrier to have the 707. They had a special version, had a shortened forward fuselage, and that gave it extra range. Uh, but look at the uh, kangaroo logo up on the tail. And then look at it here on the uh, fan jet version. They modified the markings, and now that's the famed V-Jet. Kangaroo got a little larger. And here it is center stage on the fin of the uh, 707. And uh, look at how it changes in this uh, era on the A380, and you notice that they've uh, also used the motif out on the engines, which brings the color out in a three-dimensional fashion on the airplane. But take a good look at the shape of the kangaroo on the tail here and compare it to this. It's simplified, it's almost abstracted, but still very distinctive, and you know what airline that is. Look at the wing flex on the 787. I'm always amazed at that. 
beautiful airplane. Now, we have a correction, and my thanks to viewer David White for pointing out that on the SAS airplanes, I was talking about the Dragon on the forward fuselage, and he says that's actually a stylized Viking longboat. So thank you for the correction. We appreciate it. Let's look at narrow uh, body or single aisle jets to jumbos. And uh, here's a perfect example of taking, literally taking the existing scheme and applying it to the larger airplanes, adjusting a few things for scale. But uh, this is ground zero for changing the design or adapting the design, I should say, to the larger airplane. And uh, same thing here with the Delta. We go back to the 727-200 and look at the scheme on the 747. Now, you're probably wondering to yourself, how much does all that paint weigh? Well, on a 747, uh, it's approximately 500 pounds of paint on that airplane. At Douglas, we quoted the DC-10 uh, fully painted as carrying 350 pounds of paint, and that can be pretty significant. Here's a great example of uh, literally using the same scheme on a narrow body and wide body airplane. And uh, now we're going to talk about the process in reverse. Here's the Astrojet scheme on a BAC-111 in a beautiful painting by Roy Grinnell. And uh, let's take that scheme and apply it to the first iteration of a DC-10. Yes, the DC-10 was originally a twin-engine airplane, uh, fulfilling an American Airlines requirement to have a 250-passenger wide body that could operate out of New York's LaGuardia Airport. They added the third engine on the tail to give it transcontinental range. But if you squint at this image, you notice that the markings just pretty much disappear. And so they required something different and more striking uh, to adapt to the larger airplane. And that was this scheme, the beautiful red, white, and blue stripe. Uh, we call it a cheat line going through the windows because it cheats your eye to making the airplane look longer. But here's the reverse. We took the jumbo jet scheme and applied it to the narrow body, and it's just as striking. Here's the American scheme today. A lot of mixed reaction about this. I'm not going to get into all the uh, details of uh, you know design, but uh, it lives in the modern world. It, it's distinctive. You can always tell an American airplane, and uh, I'll leave it at that. So look at how the color schemes from the late 1950s, the first generation of jets, uh, changed to the wide body scheme seen here on the DC-10s. That first shot was at Renton, Washington. This shot is at Long Beach. And uh, just to save the comments, you notice the DC-10 on the end of the row there has a national sun god tail with a CP air fuselage. What's that all about? Well, the story is that the airplane was built for national airlines, but they merged with Pan Am before the airplane could be delivered. That order was canceled, and the airplane was then bought by CP Air. Gives a unique scheme. Uh, there's a great story about this airplane. You may be familiar, but uh, the DC-8 uh, Series 40 with the Rolls engines, uh, seen here in formation with an Air Force F-104 Starfighter in a dive. What's that all about? Well, on August 21st, 1961, over Edwards Air Force Base, uh, this airplane with a flight, Douglas flight test crew uh, pushed over from 52,000 feet and dove down, achieving a speed of Mach 1.012, it's about 662 miles an hour, and this became the first commercial jet airplane to uh, achieve supersonic flight. I'm not going to call it a supersonic transport by any means, but it did uh, that in a calibrated test over Edwards Air Force Base. And the F-104 was flown by none other than Chuck Yeager, the first man to do it. Now, there's a great story here with the CP Air DC-10. Uh, we worked really hard to win this uh, competition. And we got the order from CP Air. It was a real victory for Douglas at that time. Uh, I was on night shift. And uh, I mentioned that because the gentleman that you see there in the jump seat uh, is uh, Jack McHale, who was the uh, lead salesman on the pitch for the DC-10 to CP Air. Uh, normally, they have very strict rules about people looking out of windows on an uh, air-to-air photo run. But we made an exception in this case. Jack was so excited and so proud. And to show his thanks, he brought dinner into the art department for everybody. You ready? Pizza with Canadian bacon. True story. The airline was very proud of their DC-10. They had me uh, do this uh, coloring book page for uh, their younger flyers and uh, color me orange. And it was a very effective uh, marketing uh, moment. 
Uh, let's talk about the one-of-a-kind schemes. Uh, we had some of those in part one, and here's some more. This is the famed uh, Qantas Aborigine scheme on the 747-400, the Equatoriana scheme on the 707, and the ANA Pokemon scheme. And I understand that people actually booked flights just to fly on these airplanes because uh, they liked it for the kids. Very effective marketing. Retro jets. Well, what we mean by that we take uh, original markings from an uh, early classic era and apply them to current jetliners that you see here. And here's a selection of European carriers on Airbus and uh, 737-800. And uh, just, you know, a, a, a proper homage to the history of the airlines. I, I, I can't say enough about this. I think it's tremendous that the airlines recognize and celebrate their history. And I'm going to close with this question. Uh, please leave your answer in the comments. Which color scheme do you like better on the 747? That's the delivery scheme on top and the final scheme of the airline before it merged with American in 2001. Which one's your favorite? And there you have it, a look at uh, more airline color schemes. I want to say thank you to the very special people who make these presentations possible. And uh, you see some pretty heavy-duty names here in the airline world. And my thanks to these wonderful folks for their input and support. So thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. We appreciate having you watch these. We love making them for you. If you haven't subscribed, please do. We'd love to have you on board. And uh, if you'd kindly hit the like button on the way out, that does help us with YouTube. As always, until next time, take care. <laughs>